Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's story is called Broken, the Murder of Kylie Smith. It's by press reporter Nadine Porter, who joins me now. Hi, Nadine. Hi, Mike. First of all, set this story up for us. Some listeners might recognise that name, Kylie Smith, but uh, tell us about her and what happened to her. So Kylie was a 15-year-old schoolgirl in Owaka, a very small South Otago rural community, and she was tragically uh, abducted, raped and murdered in 1991. This story goes further than that. That was quite an infamous crime at the time, and, and people may remember it. But you go a little bit further and look beyond Kylie's death and the ramifications of what happened here to the people around her and, and the town itself. Tell us about that. So it was really important that we talked about the impact on this community, that even 30 years later, people were reluctant to talk about it because it was so raw, even now. And uh, I myself have a personal connection to this. I knew Kylie. We were in a um, representative netball team, and I lived well, 25 minutes away in Clinton. So we kind of, our schools mixed together, and uh, we knew she was an up-and-coming star academically and in the horse world as well. So when we talk about the ramifications, it's not just the community, the wider community, and how they coped in the wake of this murder. The story hones in on one family and one person in particular and the effect that this case and this murder had on them. So just set that up a little bit for us. After Kylie's death, the community looked for someone to blame. And the person they did blame, the family they did blame, was the family of a Baptist pastor in Owaka, uh, simply because they had helped to bring the perpetrator into the community, but they unwittingly brought him in, not knowing that he had a history of this kind of offending. And this person played a part in the story. After Kylie's death, he was involved in the investigation, and this is sort of the rub of the story, is this was not known in the community at the time, and hasn't really been known publicly at all, and, and is the thrust of the story, yeah? Yeah, so for the first time ever, we revealed that the Baptist pastor was solely responsible for the perpetrator pleading guilty to the crime. And that's something the community didn't know, and it's something he kept to himself over many, many years. And interestingly enough, when we published the story initially, we got a huge response from people in the community who felt very sorry about the way they reacted to the Baptist family uh, initially after Smith's death. All right, thanks, Nadine. Let's get into it. Here is Nadine, and I should warn with some strong content, reading her story, Broken, the murder of Kylie Smith. The last time Angie Wood went riding after school with her best friend Kylie Smith was also the last time she felt free to roam the wide country roads around their town. It was a fresh, overcast spring day in 1991, typical of late October, and their sleepy little nook of Owaka, about 100 kilometres south of Dunedin, was quiet. As they rode down the main street, they waved to locals they'd known all their lives. At 15, Kylie was developing into a promising young equestrian. She shone at the Catlins Area School where her mother Dawn taught and was the apple of her father's eye, plumber Bevan Smith. Tall, blonde and with blue eyes, she was easily identifiable on her black Mount Nick as she rode out of town. Most days she wore her signature black and yellow Balmoral Pony Club hat and oilskin raincoat. With her wide smile and infectious personality, Kylie was popular among her schoolmates. She was a class captain and on the school council. Academically gifted, she was also an accomplished netballer and swimmer and planned to become a vet. Angie looked up to her friend and felt like she was her kid's sister. She used to say, come on Angie, come riding with mother. As the girls rode that day, a battered pale blue Volkswagen Beetle drove past them. They glimpsed a young man who waved at them from behind the wheel. A few moments later, they giggled as he did a U-turn and drove back past them slowly. Angie had seen the same car parked outside the school grounds the previous day, but didn't think anything of it. Coming back into town, they passed the car again, now parked outside the chemist near Kylie's house, before carrying on home. 
Angie was to encounter the skinny, lank-haired young man again the following day outside the chemist, leaning on the car's bonnet. He called out hi and then said, nice day, when she came out of the shop. She politely agreed. The 13-year-old noticed him staring at her as she walked down the street, and she had an uneasy feeling he was checking her out. Two days later, she would be faced with the grim realisation that that man was Paul Bailey, a sexually violent deviant who abducted, raped and murdered her best friend and who might just have been fantasising about doing the same thing to her. It was to have a profound impact on the rest of her life. Today, there is still an undercurrent of sadness in her voice. There was the what ifs, she says. What if I had been there that day? I was riding, but I had to go around the block to drop off some homework for a friend, and I came out on the main road and it was just her horse. It would have only been minutes. There were few support services available to her back then. Angie began to wish she had been the one taken. It should have been me, because she really was beautiful, she says. She was really blossoming and was going to her first prom. At Kylie's funeral, Angie was too numb to cry. All she remembers is the ringing in her ears. Unable to concentrate at school, she dropped out in the fifth form and began working in sharing gangs. A promising equestrian herself, she no longer felt safe riding alone and lost interest in attending horse shows without her friend. At home, everything changed. Where once she could have taken off to play torch tag, her parents now had rules. Drowning in shock and grief, she began to rebel. Thirty years on, she is still dealing with the terrible events, and the idea of Bailey ever being released from prison makes her want to cry. I had a great upbringing, she says, and didn't know there was evil like that. I lost my innocence. Two months before Kylie's murder, a young woman was having a game of pool and enjoying an end-of-day beer at the Ettrick Tavern in central Otago, at the same time as Bailey, an orchard worker with a drink problem. The woman had seen the pale 27-year-old before, so when a drunk Bailey asked her for a lift home later that evening, she obliged. Her charity proved a mistake. Police files, never before released publicly but acquired by stuff, revealed the depths of Paul Bailey's depravity. Bailey liked young schoolgirls, so much so that when he and his partner Rose Shortland lived in Motueka in the late 1980s, he bought a school skirt, white shirt and black stockings for her to wear. For some reason, the pair fled to Ettrick with their infant son, leaving behind her outfit, so Rose and Bailey's mother, Doreen, bought a replacement. Paul's mother said that she would like one too, Rose would later tell the police in a statement. She said to me that she liked uniforms because her husband did. It was like father, like son. Just 14, when she had run away with a 21-year-old Bailey to the South Island, Rose had become used to her partner's sexual fantasies. But those fantasies took a dark turn when the couple and their two young children moved to Ettrick in late 1988. A charming man, Bailey befriended a local 12-year-old girl, inviting her to his home where she would smoke cannabis with him and Rose. Around the same time, the couple's baby daughter Linda died of severe burns after her bassinet caught fire in their kitchen. Witnesses would go on to claim the infant had been deliberately left on the oven elements, but Bailey denied that, saying it was on the bench and the elements were on to warm the kitchen. The baby's death was eventually ruled accidental, though some, including firefighters, had their doubts. Bailey started drinking heavily, sharing whiskey with the girl he was grooming. She began staying overnight, her father ignorant to what was unfolding. Bailey soon subjected her to a sexual encounter after giving her pills and alcohol. His fetish came to the fore later when he asked her to keep her school uniform on. The encounters became increasingly violent. According to her police statement, the girl said Bailey first raped her at knife point in a tool shed where there was an old mattress on the floor and pornographic pictures covering the walls. While on holiday with a couple in Nelson, Bailey raped her repeatedly. 
the girl said he had a thing for rivers, an environment similar to where Kylie died. Rose, herself damaged by Bailey, claimed that she was out of it on drugs and alcohol during that period and said at one stage she told the girl to lay a rape complaint with police. Even Bailey's mother knew of what he was doing to the girl, but didn't deem it serious enough to report. Bailey had a strange relationship with his parents, which seems to have begun as a child in England where he lived until 1972. Bailey apparently told a confidant his mother was harsh. The family moved to New Zealand and stayed for seven years before returning to England between 1979 and 1981. Bailey told both Rose and the girl that he had murdered a person in England, shooting him on a rugby field. New Zealand police would make inquiries with their UK counterparts, but no evidence of such a murder was ever found. Back in Ettrick, Bailey directed the woman from the bar down several back roads, away from his home. He told her to park outside some old huts, but instead of getting out, he became aggressive and told her he was going to rape her. Petrified, she managed to flee to a house. But as she screamed for help, Bailey caught up, put his hand over her mouth to muffle the cries and pushed her back into the car. He drove her to a nearby hut, dragged her inside, took his clothes off and tried to sexually assault her. The violence only stopped when neighbours noticed the lights and came to investigate. Later, Bailey would claim he blacked out from alcohol and didn't remember any of it. The traumatised woman complained to police, but Bailey denied a charge of attempted rape. The court granted him name suppression and released him on bail on September 26, 1991. That set in motion a turn of events that would lead to Kylie's death and ignite a tinderbox of anger. You can't imagine how horrible it is to take the stand and be treated like you're the one in the wrong, especially in a sexual crime situation. From Bird of Paradise for Stuff, this is Tell Me About It. Going behind the scenes of our journalism to the voices of real people whose stories make the news. You're just so out of control of it, you know. I felt like a ghost of the system a lot of the time. It's like, no, why can no one actually see who I am? With me, Kirsty Johnston, Michelle Duff, and our producer, Noel McCarthy. Can I ask you a question that makes it quite basic? Has it all been worth it? From a justice point of view, I would still struggle to say that right now, but it's still raw. Tell Me About It was made possible by New Zealand On Air. Subscribe and review us, please, on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. When a young Baptist pastor, his wife and their two young children arrived in Oaxaca 18 months before Kylie went missing, they were welcomed by the community. Kind, friendly and fresh from Bible college, the couple were happy to call the cosy town their home. They ministered to full congregations on Sunday mornings and their children attended the local school and play centre. It was at one of those Sunday services, two weeks before Kylie's death, that the pastor and his wife first saw Bailey and his family in the pews. Bailey seemed genial, his partner warm and well-spoken. A member of the Baptist congregation in Roxburgh, a town in central Otago, rang the Owaka pastor and said he understood Bailey was living in the area and might need some help. A week later, Bailey told the pastor he was living near Kaka Point, but needed a job and a car. The pastor and his wife agreed to help the struggling young family. That's what churches do, says the pastor. They help people. He is recounting for the first time what happened three decades ago. Stuff has agreed not to name him to protect his safety. Bailey admitted to the pastor he was on bail from an incident in Ettrick, but claimed he had been falsely accused. He said the woman had made it up and he had only tried to kiss and cuddle her. The pastor was uneasy. He asked police in nearby Balclutha about Bailey, but they could tell him nothing, and he began to believe Bailey's version of events. If police had concerns, he reasoned, they would have raised them. The week Bailey killed Kylie, the pastor drove him to a court hearing in Alexandra, hoping to find out more. 
the judge said there was insufficient evidence to proceed and adjourned proceedings. The pastor, who still didn't know what Bailey was accused of doing, felt more assured of his story, unaware of how skilled a liar and manipulator he was. He pulled the wool over my eyes right from the word go, the pastor says. The pastor and his wife set about helping the young family, passing on details of a local with a blue Volkswagen for sale. Several times, they welcomed Bailey and his family into their home. But they wondered why his children flinched when he made quick movements. Rose confided in the pastor's wife that Bailey was aggressive after drinking. The pastor helped him find work, repairing a drain for Ian Wallace, the local pharmacist. Wallace found Bailey hardworking and asked him what he was going to court for. You name it, Bailey said, except for drugs and violence. The day before the murder, Bailey ended up working alongside Bevan Smith, Kylie's dad, at Wallace's property where Bevan was contracted to lay pipe. Shortly after 2pm on November the 1st, Bailey pulled up outside the pastor's home. The couple saw him fiddling with something in the front seat. Bailey then helped the pastor load a gun cabinet into his car to take to a Balclutha sports shop. When the pastor drove away, he left Bailey talking to his wife on the lawn. He didn't know that the object Bailey had been fiddling with was a sawn-off twenty two rifle. Friday, November the 1st started much the same as any other day in the Smith household. Dawn Smith had left for work before Kylie awoke. The teenager got dressed and headed into the kitchen. She tussled with her father over the newspaper so she could read it during breakfast. After school, she walked home and fetched a bite to eat. At 4.30, she was out the door to ride her horse, Nick. In the drizzle, she headed south out of Olwaka towards a local farm. Had the weather been any worse, she would have ridden around the town instead. The last known sighting of Kylie was as she rode Nick south along Waikawa Road, just 200 metres from the town and in sight of passing traffic. A farmer saw her talking to someone in a dark car parked at the side of the road. Police later learned that what the farmer most likely saw were the last moments before Kylie was forced from her horse at gunpoint, ordered to lie down in the back of the car and abducted. Minutes later, the local mailman saw Kylie's startled horse cantering up the main street. He grabbed the animal and soon found Kylie's best friend, Angie Wood, and another riding companion who were running late and trying to catch up with Kylie. The mailman handed Nick to them while he went to look for Kylie. At 5.25, Kylie's friends went to her home and found Bevan in the basement workshop. Sensing something wasn't right, he drove to the farm where Kylie was meant to be practising, but she wasn't there. At around the same time, an ambulance siren was heard, so Bevan went to the medical centre thinking Kylie may have been injured in a fall. She wasn't there either. She was already far from town, heading in the opposite direction to where she had been riding, hidden inside a blue Volkswagen, driven by a man her father had been working with the day before. In 1991, in the heart of the Catlins, Owaka, population 429, was the kind of town where the doctor not only delivered you, but counselled you. Where the local constable wasn't just a name on a badge, but a friend and a rugby mate. A conservative place with the highest rate of church attendance in the country. Knitted together by blood or mateship in their peaceful valley, the locals saw the wider world largely through the lens of television news. But by six o'clock on November the 1st, there was an unease, a sense that something intangible was shifting and that darkness was looking for a place to land. As news of Kylie's disappearance spread, more than 200 locals joined the hunt for a girl who symbolised everything their small patch of paradise represented. Farmers, freezing workers and ministers joined emergency services and the Smith family to spend a wet night hunting for the teenager in bush, paddocks and streams. For Kylie's mother, the wait for news was cruel. The steady stream of visitors kept Dawn's house full, yet she felt empty inside. 
From the moment an anguished Bevan had run into the school staff room to tell her their daughter was missing, she knew something was dreadfully wrong. Initially, they hoped Kylie had fallen from her horse and perhaps broken a leg, but after an hour of searching, it became clear they had to call the police. A base was set up in the local fire station, and officers from Balclutha and Dunedin arrived swiftly. By 7pm, Dawn and Bevan were stuck inside their house on police orders, increasingly desperate. Drained, Dawn lay on the sofa, not registering what was around her. She felt something on her forehead. She touched it, but there was nothing there. Only a feeling like a spider walking across her skin. I thought, I think Kylie's telling me something, she tells stuff 30 years on. That's when I realised she wasn't coming back. The following day, she would find out that at about the time of her strange sensation, her daughter was shot dead. Hours passed until a detective, Senior Sergeant John Scott, arrived to ask for a photo to release to the media. As night became morning, Dawn and Bevan were still in limbo, their happy home now a prison, as they began to realise there was no hope of finding Kylie alive. Dawn's thoughts flitted from being convinced she'd been abducted and was being held in Kaka Point to being terrified someone had drowned at Punawere, a settlement at the mouth of the Catlins River. Her biggest fear was that they would not find Kylie's body, something she could not bear. We needed to find her and bring her home, she says. For young Clinton Constable Steve Wilkes, the memory of that night and the following day remains raw. A policeman of only five years, he found himself in a helicopter that Friday evening searching south of Awaka. It was later revealed Kylie was still alive at that point, but moving in the opposite direction. He often thinks about what might have been had they searched north of the town instead of south where she was last seen. It sticks in my mind, Wilkes says, and it never goes away. On the day he raped and shot Kylie, Paul Bailey spent the morning in Balclutha. He collected a food parcel from the Salvation Army and bought wine from Liquorland, despite drinking being against his bail conditions. At a garage, he picked up a map of Owaka, one that showed all the gravel roads in the area. Errands complete, Bailey returned home for lunch before arguing with his partner Rose about a visit to the pastor. At 2pm, he took a 22 caliber rifle from a drawer, telling Rose he planned to shoot rabbits. Bailey had sawn off the barrel and stock of the weapon, effectively turning it into a pistol. He had loaded the magazine the night before with nine shots. He fired four at a tin can and left five in the gun. He told Rose he was heading to Awaka to check if the weather was settled enough to continue the drainage job. He dropped into the pastor's house before driving south to the Punawea campground, circling it slowly before taking an indirect route back to Awaka. Police later realised Bailey had been scoping out the terrain. Back in Awaka, he slowly drove past another girl on Waikawa Road at about 4.15pm, 15 minutes before Kylie went missing. That 17-year-old was a relative of Kylie's and looked eerily similar, with long, blonde hair and a tall, athletic frame. She later said Bailey stared at her while he drove past, leaving her so unsettled she told her father. Bailey cruised the town streets and was seen looking nervous and fidgety while reading a map at the corner of Waikawa Road and Stewart Street. Kylie was riding about 150 metres ahead of him. Four months later, while in jail, Bailey gave a statement explaining what he did next. He said he had gone out with a gun and just got carried away with the fantasy. It just got out of control, he said. Police asked the pastor to persuade him to confess. Bailey told the pastor his intention was always to rape and kill Kylie and that he chose her because she was taller than all other girls and she stood out. Bailey said he stopped next to Kylie, just outside Awaka, showed her his gun and ordered her to get off her horse and to lie across the car's rear seat. He said she was submissive as he drove north. 
After narrowly missing another car and forcing it into a ditch, Bailey drove towards Nugget Point Lighthouse, about 20 k's east of Owaka, near where Bailey was living. Several kilometres before the lighthouse, he collided head-on into a car with two American tourists, damaging his car's bonnet. Bailey sped off. The tourists did not see Kylie, but their report to police would prove vital in capturing her killer. Bailey said he then drove to a scenic lookout, ordered Kylie from the car at gunpoint and walked her down to the beach, around a point and up into some scrubby bush. It was there, he said, that he raped her, before ordering her to get dressed. Two divers on the beach left him anxious that they may have been seen, and he sped back to Karoro Creek Road in a panic, stopping at a lay-by beside a dense hill covered in scrub on the pretext of having sex again. Ordering Kylie from the car, he marched her across a stream in her socks and up steep terrain to a small, flat patch on the wet hillside. Police believe Bailey then forced Kylie to take off her riding coat, place her helmet and crop on the ground and remove her gumboots, tracksuit pants and underpants before raping her. He allowed her to put back on her underpants and tracksuit pants. Before she could dress further, he shot her in the back of the head. He arranged her in a partial recovery position, then shot her twice more. Bailey then placed Kylie's helmet beside her. He draped a riding coat over her and covered her body with dead branches and ferns. On the drive home, he stopped to hide the gun and lupins on the side of the road near the town of Kaka Point. At 7.15pm, Rose welcomed Bailey home. She was relieved that he seemed happy after their argument that afternoon and the pair settled down to watch television. That domesticity was shattered at 1.45 the next morning when two police officers woke them to question Bailey about his movements hours earlier. Police noted Bailey's nervous disposition and thought he was acting suspiciously. Afterwards, Bailey went back to bed and the couple talked about Kylie being missing. They then prayed for the family and Rose said she hoped Kylie wasn't dead. Don't think too much about it, Bailey replied. Try to sleep. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, host of The Long Read. If you're an advertiser and you like what you're hearing, you could help us keep making podcasts like this one. Thousands of people listen to Stuff Podcasts every day. So if you'd like to be part of one of New Zealand's biggest and best podcast platforms, go to advertise.stuff.co.nz slash audio and get in touch with us. Back to the show. Kylie Smith's body was found the next day a Saturday afternoon. That was when the lives of the Baptist pastor and his family changed irrevocably. Today, the events of those hours and days are still so raw, they remain fearful of publicity and hesitant in telling their story. That morning, police visited the pastor, who had been out searching, to tell him they believed Bailey had abducted and murdered Kylie. Officers had searched Bailey's house, They noticed his efforts to fix his car and took him to Balclutha Police Station for questioning. Now they wanted the pastor to talk to Bailey to find out where Kylie was. Shocked, he couldn't comprehend what they were saying. I just didn't think he had the ability to kill someone, he tells Stuff. The pastor agreed to help police and talked with Bailey alone in his cell for several hours, repeatedly asking if he had murdered Kylie. Eventually, after being told her body had been found, Bailey hung his head. Yes, I did. I killed her, he said. Horrified, the pastor didn't want to continue, but knew the police needed him to persuade Bailey to formally plead guilty. That day, and the six meetings with Bailey over the next two months, were among the most harrowing the pastor has ever experienced. In some ways, my belief back then was that this guy deserves to die for what he has done, he says. I know I shouldn't say that, but I was so angry and bitter with him. In the hours before Kylie's body was found, the pastor recalls how calm and collected Bailey appeared. I've since realised that he thought he was going to get off with it, he says. 
And then when they found Kylie and we told him, he started to fall apart a bit. That's when he confessed to me. Bailey revealed a strange logic to his offending when the pastor asked why Bailey hadn't killed his own wife that afternoon. He just looked at me in real horror and said, I would never kill your wife. It was then the pastor understood Bailey's warped standards, that it was acceptable to kill people he didn't know. The pastor worked secretly with the police for months and eventually persuaded Bailey to reveal where he had hidden the rifle. But getting him to plead guilty to murder proved more difficult, particularly as Bailey's lawyer urged him to deny it. The lawyer and the pastor clashed repeatedly. Eventually, the pastor won out and convinced Bailey to admit his crimes. On February 7, 1992, Bailey finally pleaded guilty to raping and murdering Kylie. He was jailed for life with a minimum non-parole period of 10 years for the murder and 13 years for the rape. He has since been repeatedly denied parole. At his most recent hearing, in 2021, he was told he would not be released for at least another two years. But because Bailey's case never went to trial, the community never heard how he came to be in Owaka or the truth behind Kylie's murder. In the days after the murder... Tension simmered as locals realised an outsider who had come into their midst only a week before was responsible for the atrocity. With Bailey locked in a cell and no answers forthcoming, they needed a target for their anger. Numb, Dawn Smith remembers little of the events of the following days, but admits she and her husband were in part responsible for what happened next. For Bevan, the idea that a church had tried to help his daughter's killer was too much. He and the community directed their anger at the pastor, his family, and the pharmacist who had employed Bailey. The bitterness escalated into abuse and threats. The dark side of grief took over. Murderer was daubed on the pastor's home. The pastor vividly remembers picking up his youngest child from preschool, only to find the boy in the corner of the classroom because carers had shunned him. The local garage refused to serve the family. Locals boycotted the pharmacy, and the pastor learned of a plan to firebomb both his own home and Bailey's. A mob also threatened to burn down his church. With little help from police, the pastor arranged for Rose and her children to get somewhere safe before fleeing with his own family to Milford Sound. He expected their home to be in ashes when they returned. We really feared for our lives, he says. Vigilantes did burn down Bailey's house, but the pastors were spared. But the steady stream of untruths and rumours broke the terrified family. They fled. They moved to Alexandra. Persecution followed, and the pastor was forced to defend allegations from the local police, one of whom was a close relative of Kylie's mother. Fighting those charges took 15 months and cost him all his savings and his job. The Baptist Church dumped him, saying it couldn't endure more negative headlines. Moving on again, they put the pain of Bailey's legacy behind them. The pastor became a salesman and a successful businessman, along with his wife. But the hurt of the last 30 years inhabits him, and the darkness of what a community became is never far from his mind. Fourteen years ago, he and his wife lost their 18-year-old son in an accident. The grieving couple had to endure spiteful comments from people with connections to Awaka, who told them their son deserved to die because the pastor, they claimed, had caused Kylie's death. Today he is no longer a man of the cloth and no longer goes to church. Yet despite all the sorrow, he has managed to keep his faith. I've got this amazing wife who has been incredible, he says. That probably helped. I suppose the saying, the truth will set you free, has kept me strong. The truth is that Paul Bailey was a murderer, and the truth is that I helped put him in prison. I have to keep that to the forefront of my mind. He feels immense sadness for the Smith family, but believes the police let everyone down. They were quite happy for us to take the brunt, he says. If the police who handled the first complaint about Bailey and Ettrick had done their job, 
Kylie would still be alive, but they didn't. The pastor understands why Kylie's father reacted as he did, but wishes he had been given the opportunity to sit down with the family and explain how Bailey wormed his way into his life. I never got the opportunity and was not allowed to go to Kylie's funeral, he said. It would be good to sit down and pass on our condolences to Dawn. For Barry Hanson, the sole constable stationed at Awaka in 1991, the events of November 1st are never far from his thoughts. Hanson was on a day off when Kylie went missing. He has asked himself time and again if he could have helped save her. Hanson was never alerted by the Alexandra District Court or police that Bailey was in the area. Something, he believes, should have happened. Had he known of Bailey's attempted rape charge and bail, he would have insisted he report every day to the police station and would have watched him closely. In the months after the tragedy, Hanson would find himself walking down Owaka's quiet streets at 3.30am, wondering what he could have done to change the outcome. It will never go away for me, he says. Like Hanson, former detective John Scott, who led the investigation, believes Bailey should never be released from prison. Despite now suffering from dementia, Scott remembers clearly the effect Kylie's murder had on Owaka. In a small town like that, everybody knows everybody, he says. It knocks people around. A 1992 victim impact statement put together by police on behalf of the community supported Scott's sentiments. It said Bailey's actions shattered any illusions the people of Owaka previously held of it being a safe place to bring up children. Scott had a more succinct way of putting it. It crucified them. Now 71, Dawn likens the impact of her daughter's murder to a stone thrown into a pool. The ripple got bigger and bigger. Her husband's life ended that day, she feels. It tormented him that he wasn't there for Kylie in her final hours. Bevan would go over and over the fear and terror she would have experienced. The unending anguish left a once active community stalwart, a husk of a man, withdrawn and bitter. Bevan Smith died in 2011, aged 60, from a brain hemorrhage. Dawn believes he died of a broken heart. She still lives in the large Owaka house she and Bevan lovingly built, but she is alone instead of enjoying family weekends with her husband and Kylie's children. She has three grandchildren from son, Rianne, but it struggles to fill the hole. At his latest parole hearing, Bailey admitted he still had sexually inappropriate thoughts about women. Dawn, who gave evidence to the parole board, was delighted at the decision to keep him behind bars. Bailey, she said, should never be released. Although a caring, resilient woman, she has a residing anger for the man who destroyed so many lives. If he walked in the room now, she says, I would pick up a knife and I would kill him. I just loathe the man intensely. If he gets out, we're all in trouble. That was Broken, the murder of Kylie Smith, on the long read from Stuff, written and read by Nadine Porter and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was edited by Jack Price. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listened via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on the Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening. 